Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Dying Time is here. That's right, we're talking about Amityville 3D on Kill by Kill. Lee, oh, God damn it, I almost started again. <laughs> I forgot the intro to my own show. <laughs> Uh, hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody. It's your old pal, Patrick Hamilton, coming to you once again from my small uh, seaside burg in Long Island or Tom's River, New Jersey or Mexico City. This is the Kill by Kill podcast where we are dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. Now, we're going to unpack all the goriest of details of Amityville 3D in the hopes that a, a skeptic's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes that we can make at their expense. And as always, there is only one person I trust to effectively communicate how cold it is in any particular house. The one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I'm just getting flash chilled by something in that house. It's just <laughs> it, is, uh, it is wild. That apparently, it's, uh, they blasted hot wax onto people. That's it's not like that, fake that snow. Seems, it's hot that, wax. That seems dangerous. It seems exceptionally dangerous and messy and gross, but not messy and gross in a sexy way. You know what I mean? <laughs> you mean like in a, a body of evidence sort of way? Yes, in a body. Exactly, Gina. You read my mind. When I think sexy, I think body of evidence and William Defoe getting wax dripped on his chest. Uh, but uh, listen, Gina, I don't want to scare you. But we are not alone here, okay? We have two very special guests. The first one, of course, a beloved returning champion to Kill by Kill and a filmmaker in his own right. And the second, a wildly successful cult leader. Together, they form a great new venture called Midnight Mass that you will find on your podcatcher very soon. The ones, the onlys, Michael Verratti and Peaches Christ. Welcome the both of you. Yay. Thank Yay. you. Thank you for having Thanks. us. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure to be here. I have to tell you that sitting in silence and listening to someone talk about body of evidence and not getting to pipe up is is like torture for me because that movie is amazing. Uh, Madonna delivers one of my, I, wait, I, remind me, I can swear on the show, right? Yeah, yes. oh, hell yeah. Okay, because my one of my favorite lines in cinema history is delivered by Madonna when she says, that's what I do. I fuck. <laughs> <laughs> my my favorite my favorite part about body of evidence that you're supposed to the audience is supposed to accept that Willem Dafoe is someone who has never experienced weird sex before. <laughs> right. So someone who definitely has a sex dungeon in his house has never had. Oh wow, you know, handcuffs. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Press the brakes. <laughs> Maybe touch the gas. Yeah. <laughs> Shy sex kitten. That's <laughs> William Defoe for you. I'm sorry. That's missionary with the lights off for me, lady. <laughs> yeah. I have to say body of evidence uh, for me marks a sort of special place in my cinema history because it's the only film that I've ever been asked to leave uh, by ushers working <laughs> for the theater because, um, uh, well, no, I should say this. It's the only film I've ever been asked to leave while being sober. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I uh, I was with my friend Martini, my flawed, tragic sidekick, and we were howling so much in central <laughs> Pennsylvania watching Body of Evidence, and we loved it. I mean, we thought it was amazing, but the other people who were in that cinema did not seem to appreciate our response to the movie, and we were asked to leave. They found it a <laughs> deathly serious character study that you were somehow sullying with your humor exactly. and enjoyment. <laughs> exactly. And it, I mean, it was just, we were like, this is awesome, you know. <laughs> I think that's the exact right uh, reaction to it. But, uh, oh, what were we talking about again? Oh, a movie. Hot is wax. E yeah, hot <laughs> wax. And that brings us to Amityville 3D, the third film in the Amityville. Um, I, I don't know how many films are in it. There's like there's like 20, and yeah. I think at this point. Well, the reason is is because Amityville is a real place, and you can't copyright the the name of a town. So yeah. any Tom, Dick, Dick, or Jane can make an Amityville movie if they so choose. If we after this wanted to make the Amityville Board of Tourism horror movie, we could. <laughs> that doesn't mean that we should, and that's the important thing to know. <laughs> it really hasn't stopped anyone else, Michael. That's the thing. It's that's like, true. It, it, it is a very easy bar to cross, and. 
uh, there, there's a lot of forgettable things in, in the Amityville history. Occasionally, you know, a Canadian actor will appear on screen with very low rise, uh, pajama bottoms and just blow you away with his cum gutters. There's a lot <laughs> of vaunted history. You know, occasionally you have a brother and sister who have sex. You get a lot. There's you get a, a, a you, lot. You get, you get a, a haunted lamp. It's one of my personal favorites of this franchise. Yes. So that's Amityville for the evil within. And um, I think that that trio of movies that come after the first three, uh, the evil within uh, it's about time. And I think the Amityville dollhouse uh, for listeners who don't know at, at the end of this movie, when, you know, the house goes bye-bye, the objects are sold in a haunted yard sale or some other R.L. Stein <laughs> c- contrivance. And then so wherever they end up is like uh, the plots of the next three movies. And we get that like kind of super draggy, like Patty Duke movie with the mm-hmm. haunt. It's like a haunted lamp. That's like, yeah, that's the haunted lamp one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some like bullshit Ikea stuff. Like it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> I love this. Um, yeah. It, well, it, this house blowing up, much like the opening credits of Friday the 13th for a long time, it, it, the house is constantly blowing up. It, at the end of two, The Possession, which is a prequel to the original Amityville horror, the house blows up. And <laughs> it, it was a grand surprise to me. <laughs> and then they were able to reconstitute that house somehow. But Yeah, listen, so does it just sort of like pull itself back together? Like, how does that work? You know, right. Uh, you know, it's it sort of, yeah, I, I don't get it. I mean, I, I was I, watching this movie at this time. I actually had to go look at the date because, you know, there was enough poltergeist esque stuff that I had to figure out, you know, which came first. And mm-hmm. it looks like this movie came first, if I'm not mistaken. What, what, when did poltergeist come out? Poltergeist. 82. Oh, no. Okay. So this is after Poltergeist. So, yes, but uh, it's in production while Poltergeist. It's like they're not exactly, I don't think it's uh, a wide enough space for them to react necessarily. Right. That makes sense. But the house blowing up at the end, I was like, oh, that's so Poltergeist, you know? Yeah. And yeah. there's a lot going on with um, <laughs> like creepy trees and mm-hmm. and lots of twigs scratching at the windows, you know, over and over again. Um, and yeah, we I, had I, a we had a movie called Doppelganger a little while ago uh, with Drew Barrymore, in which a oh, branch yeah. <laughs> is constantly brushing itself against the window, and I'm like, did they hire the same branch guys? There's a lot of branch in <laughs> a this lot movie. of branch, yeah, yeah, for sure. And Meg Ryan, um, recognizable. Oh yeah, right, yes. recognizable Meg Ryan. Yeah, you see her in this movie, and it like suddenly comes alive because there's a little bit of dead air running around in this movie. Yeah, a, a little bit. When she, <laughs> 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 when she flipper to gibbets in the middle of a living room, you're like, oh my god, it's like a warm blanket. You just yeah. want to crawl inside of that performance and like, oh my God, I'm in the hands of a movie star. I'm into it. I know I want more of that hair. I want more of that blue eyeshadow. It just all works for me. You mean, well, the, you mean the scene where she's basically like teasing her friends, like, you know, a bunch of people died in this house. <laughs> Let me take you on a tour of your new death house. Well, if we learn anything from Amityville 3D, my main <laughs> takeaway is that when Harry Met Sally is not Meg Ryan's first horny diner conversation. <laughs> It sure isn't. (laughs) It is not. Uh, In fact, fact, we're going to find another connection very soon. Uh, Just so people know, this movie was directed by Richard Fleischer. He was kind of a journeyman director. He did a lot of things. Uh, But he has some classics on his resume. He's got 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. He's got Fantastic Voyage, which, while overly long, is a really good movie. Soylent Green, you know, okay, but it's got a cult to it. Uh, he, the one amazing experiment on his CV is the Boston Strangler, which is oh. pretty, like, it's genre-defying, that movie. It's The way it's filmed is crazy. But on the flip side of it, he has some fucked up bombs. Dr. Doolittle nearly crashed 20th Century Fox. And then like two years later, they make him do Torah, 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 which also fucking bombs. And then after this movie, he makes a one-two punch of Conan the Destroyer and Red Sonia. And Yikes. he should be in jail. <laughs> Wait, is, is Destroyer the one with Grace Jones or is it the other one? 
That's it. It is the one with Grace Jones. She is the shining star of that motion picture. But everything else, including Arnold Schwarzenegger being picked up by his ankles and swung around by a monster, is uh, ungood. It it lacks that sort of snake cult that really brings barbarian together. Um, and it's also like PG. <laughs> it's like wild. Well, like, let's make a Conan movie for the kids. So is Amityville 3D, though. I think I was most shocked to discover this movie is rated PG, at least yeah. according to the uh, Pluto TV app that I watched it on. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, released at the time as a PG movie. Uh, in the New York Times, Janet Maslin's review for it stated the following. It contains enough violence to frighten small children. Does it <laughs> the capper to her review. Oh uh, it was written by David Ambrose, who came out of a lot of British TV. And, you know, I don't know that his uh, his writing career had a ton of highlights. He did have one great Ozploitation flick called The Survivor, which is great. And he also has a movie called Blackout that I've seen the video cover for a million times, but never watched. It's a guy in a black S and M leather mask. Oh, with a zipper. I know that. Oh. Movie. That's a, that's like an HBO movie. I remember that. Yeah, it actually mm-hmm. was pretty good. It's kind of more like a like a murder mystery, but I remember I th- being, I believe so. I remember yeah, being, yeah. I remember being pretty decent. Yeah. Well, well this is before PG thirteen. So, uh, yeah. uh, in in fairness, back then, if you again, not to constantly bring up Poltergeist, but that was a PG uh, rated film, True. and you know, it, it had a lot more. Uh, oomph to it uh, oh, if yeah. you ask me to say the least <laughs> sure, you know, yeah. i mean that when 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 the new york times or whoever's reviewing your horror movie and they say well you might not want to bring your toddlers uh <laughs> you know it's it's not really the most exciting <laughs> reaction yeah the movie was filmed in 3d with the same sort of effects rig that was used for friday the 13th 3d and uh, in non-3D presentations, it was called Amityville 3, The Demon, which it's really lacking a lot of demon uh, for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Uh, I would just call this Amityville 3, The Walking Around. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Amityville 3, Capped Sleeves on display is another one. There's a lot of cap sleeves. There's a lot of turtlenecks. I learned that uh, the majority of this film was uh, filmed in Mexico City. And uh, when they brought their costumes down, they were all stolen. <laughs> so if you're looking, <laughs> like this is a very off the rack motion picture. And wow. you know, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's get right into it. We open on one of the least successful tri- uh, title treatments I've ever seen committed to film. I watched this in 3D. I have the uh, Blu-ray from uh, Shout Factory, which oh. presents it in 3D. And uh, it really brought an extra dimension that none of the performances, script, music bring to it. So you, so you really you really sat back hard in your chair when that Frisbee came flying at you, oh. huh? Uh, the amount of times I leaned back and tried not to fall asleep was uh, a lot. <laughs> but in 3D, the title treatment of this looks like uh, the 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 t- three and D are wearing an Amityville themed bow tie. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure what they're trying to convey with this, but it is a wild a title treatment. And then going into this, I, I guess like the most. This is um, every single uh, person's name slowly pushes towards you. <laughs> Just slow, like Tony Roberts. <laughs> Tess Armstrong. You know, like, um, are you like, is, is this excitement? And it's just slowly painting across this house in Tom's River, New Jersey. And you're like, all right, this is the glorious reason I'm watching this in the 3D. And then, pushing my glasses up to make notes and pulling them back down to watch it. Um, but into our, uh, the, uh, the house that we've all seen before, uh, we enter John played by Tony Roberts and Melanie played by Candy Clark on some great drugs. Uh, they're dressed as inspectors Clouseau and Gadget respectively for a casual evening seance. That's one does. <laughs> That's yeah. one does. I ha- I can't say enough about Candy Clark in this movie, and I know that we're going to have plenty of time to do so, but just like from the gate, she's in a completely different film from everybody else. 
And I, I think that maybe she's the savior of this movie. If there is one, <laughs> she's definitely giving the most performance. Like she's game for whatever they're trying to do. She's trying to enliven this, like put a spark into it. And whereas Tony Roberts is, I don't know, I guess you could film my face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Candy Candy Clark is definitely pretending that more is happening than it actually is. Yeah, well, I, she, in, like, she, it's both, right? She's, she, she, she's not in the same world as everyone else. But in fairness, like her, her response when she is stuck in the house alone and then he comes back and she's running to the car and yeah. she's just like freaking out. And I actually watched it kind of with fascination, which I have to give her credit. Like at least that's, you know, m- more interesting than a lot of the performances. And I also agree with you that Meg Ryan um, brought life to the movie as well, even though she's being completely absurd and kind of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was sort of nice to see someone doing something yeah. um you know candy clark's uh reaction and, and it actually got me thinking like huh is that how i would react if i thought <laughs> I, I was just in the presence of ghosts i don't think i'd react like that but maybe she was really scared anyway Lock a couple doors and let's find out <laughs> right but i was also like, wondering like so did i miss something was she locked in the house yeah, that whole that whole sequence is very weird because, and also everybody has no problem walking just just walking into this man's house. Yeah, without, yeah that without front door is never on, locked. Without knocking on the door, <laughs> without they're just they're just walking it in and just wandering around his house. And for, and for a house that is historically told people to get out, it's yeah. constantly letting new people in. Well, yeah. and I, and I know that we're gonna get there probably as as we progress through the movie, but. Uh, You know, if Peaches is obsessed with her departure from the house, the scene I could watch on a forever loop is just her and the maid screaming at each other. Like, (laughs) because there's a moment where you both as an audience member, maybe as actor, as director, you're like, this scene should be done now. And then it keeps going. And I was just like watching with rapt fascination where I was like, she's still screaming. And (laughs) like, I could get up and make a snack and this is still happening and that to me that's that's the performance it's a deli sandwich of scenes yeah. where they, yeah. they just stuff a lot of meat in there across like two limp pieces of rye and you're like wow that's a lot of sandwich but you know like it's good pastrami but it's a lot of sandwich but she has a, she has ample opportunity to go just go out and sit in her car yeah. To and wait for him to come back, and she doesn't. Yeah, she just keeps wandering slowly around the house, you know, looking more and more nervous. But th- that doesn't stop her from like going upstairs or you know peeking in other rooms. And, and you're, you're, you're that nervous, just go wait outside. Yeah, and I she agree freaks with out, which which was fun to watch. But you're right, she she, you know, she freaks out. But it's like, wait, you weren't locked inside. Uh, and when you expect, like when I would have freaked out, she doesn't like if, if some, I don't know, grifter spit in my face, uh, I think, you know, I would have a little more of a reaction than just, just sort of like calmly wipe it off, you know, <laughs> it, sort of like, wait, you're not going to react to that, you know, no. Like that, that she feel, it feels like she gets every other week. Um, the, the, people, <laughs> the people who spit in her face are John and Emma Caswell, the, the character names. Uh, and I think they're kind of playing Ed and Lorraine Warren here. And probably the oh. most accurate to life version of Ed and Lorraine Warren that we've ever seen. I didn't film. even, I didn't even, yeah. it didn't even connect with me. I kind of clocked that, especially because when you look at The Conjuring 2, that's literally the opening of The Conjuring 2, in a way, is, is an echo of this scene with Ed and Lorraine Warren in the Amityville house. Mm-hmm. Um, what I love about the whole opening and this like fake grifter, like supernatural buddy, old, old man and woman team. Yeah. Is just all of this weird exposition, which of course I guess they think they need, but then they're like, well, the, you know, the DA has some thoughts about this. I'm like, on what, what law, (laughs) what law was broken? Like, if you're going to introduce that, I need to know because I thus far, like, I don't think it's necessarily against the law to have a seance and be like, oh, there's also a ghost. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like in the middle of them putting, making spirit fingers on a table and trying to contact Ricky who burned to death, which is foreboding for Candy Clark later on. Uh, then we see the visage of Slimer's cousin Goopy 
uh, <laughs> who arrives yeah. slowly. Like, you need to take out seconds of this. Like, this movie should not be an hour and 42 minutes. It just needs to pick up the pace in every single scene. Um, and it turns out this is all a trick, and it's it's flim-flammery, a ruse, if you will, uh, and that John and Melanie work for Reveal Magazine. And this doing. seance is busted. <laughs> uh, this thing then introduces uh, Dr. Elliot West, I assume Herbert's second cousin. I couldn't tell you. Uh, but Dr. Elliot West is a professor at the Institute for Psychic Research, Long Island State University, and who want to do other things well. It, he is a, a non-entity. He's a very small man with a very sharp haircut and haunted eyes. And he's bemused as hell that he's been dragged into the situation. He's he's this actor showed up in a lot of movies in the eighties and nineties. He was just yeah. like the professor guy or the kind of weaselly guy, like never never like a leading role. Well, this conflagration of you know people doesn't really make sense. They come from a skeptic magazine, mm -hmm. and then they're also hanging out with like psychic you <laughs> and. Like, why are all these people hanging out? Like, I don't understand. Yeah, they should be like, they should be like, you know, rivals or, or you know, each other's nemeses. Right. But then again, later on in the movie, John's wife seems to know this guy. And she's like, you need to do something. Like, they constantly work together. I don't know what the fuck's happening here. It is it is a wild team up of, of non-Avengers uh, <laughs> that makes the scene here. Uh, Dr. West says, listen, I want to check out this house. And they're like, I don't see why not. And then everyone leaves <laughs> except for flies in the cold. <laughs> they're just like, fuck this, I'm out of here. You said this movie could use editing. Like I could I could trim this movie down to like a solid TikTok or two, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't need to see another view out of those eye windows. Like I know it was a big thing. In right. the first movie, but holy fuck, stop showing me this. Well, I think they wanted to prove that they were at the house because especially if it was shot in Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My my favorite my favorite bit of trivia just about Amityville in general is that shortly after the the first movie came out, the the owners of the house up up in the actual Amityville changed the house so they wouldn't have those eye windows anymore so yes. people would not be able to find the house and then i think eventually they even went so far as to change the house number i and also then, think they moved it yeah and then eventually in tom the tom's river house yeah. which is where they filmed all the exterior shots for the original movie and and where little gina was driven past by by her aunt and, and blew her mind <laughs> It's like, oh my God, say Amityville House. But even they changed the the exterior so they didn't have those eye the the, the seeing eye windows anymore. The very next day, uh, maybe I don't know. Time works differently in Amityville three D time. But uh, Sanders, uh, the guy who now owns this house, rhymes with the look on his face as if he's about to have a threesome with John and Melanie, and then maybe eat their skin. It's uh, a <laughs> it's a weird vibe. He's that I'm very up. enthusiastic. <laughs> Uh, Sanders tries to get John to buy the house from him and Candy Clark's bangs literally popped out of the frame at me. They were in 3D and they were glorious. Oh, Wait. wow. <laughs> they 3D'd Candy Clark's bangs? Yes. I mean, it was filmed in anamorphic. So anything that stood out does stand out. And her bangs are, you know, they're horizontal. They're coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> that actually makes me jealous that I didn't get to have the 3D experience. I have to ask you, since it mm -hmm. sounds like you're the only one of the four of us who's had the 3D experience. Yes. I know that for for myself, I had seen uh, Dial M for Murder before, you know, on video or whatever, but then I went to a screening of, at the Castro Theater and saw it in 3D. Yeah. And f f what I had previously thought of as a mm, okay Hitchcock film, I um, then changed my mind and was blown away by it because certain moments like the reaching up for the telephone and things were so greatly enhanced by the 3d would you say that we missed out by not having <laughs> you know candy's bangs in our face like what would is your opinion of the film do you think better than ours is i don't think it's as big of a change as dial m for murder Okay. Or, in my opinion, Friday the 13th 3D, which mm. when we covered it on the show, we often complained, like, 
the, the, it's so brightly lit. It's so fucking hugely lit Mm -hmm. that you can see everything and the camera barely moves. And there's just, it feels like it's leaden action. And in 3D, that works a ton better. Like, I still have plenty of problems with it, but it does work better as a 3D movie. I would put this in the Jaws 3D lane, which is, it doesn't make the the movie better. It makes the experience better because it's that much more stupid. Like, it's legitimately (laughs) as stupid as intended. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like, and this is where I come in as like the curmudgeon. I feel like something like Dial M for Murder, like it felt like an event, right? And earlier tonight, uh, Peaches and I were actually talking about the era of gimmick, the idea of, you know, the William Castles of, of the mm-hmm. world and and the, the kind of grindhouse drive-in guys. And sure. I think when you have the gimmick and you plan on the gimmick, there's there's something to be said for that. Whereas these movies just were sort of like, okay, this new technology is out and let's do it. And they don't really seem to know what to do with it. And I will include Friday the 13th 3D in that too, because I don't necessarily know that in 1980, whatever, when I go to the theater, the most wowing experience of my life is going to be someone pushing a Coke can out at me, you know? <laughs> and I, I I feel like that happens a lot in this movie too, where it's just like, all right, well, here's the, you know, the jar of peanut butter or whatever the fuck it can be. Yeah, there's like, a lot of Frisbees in frame. Yeah, you know, you know, sometimes, you get a, sometimes you get a big fly in your face. Yeah, at least the fly is interesting. But I yeah, there's just so many. I, I agree with you, though. Like, for every fly, there's just, like, someone, you know, swinging a coffee mug through the, the, the frame. And I'm like, I don't care about this. <laughs> yeah, when I think of great 3D these days, and this is such a weird story, uh, that I'll just tell really quickly. I was home in Annapolis, Maryland, where I, I grew up in Maryland, and I and I was going to take my parents' car to go see a movie by myself because I needed to get away from my parents. And I said, can I borrow the car? Like, I was a teenager, even though this was just a few years ago. And they said, we'll come with you. Uh, well, they said, to where? I said, I'm going to the movies. They said, we'll come with you. I said, no, you won't. I'm seeing Piranha 3D. You don't want to come to this. <laughs> like, you, you, are, you are senior citizens. I'm going to this alone. No, they insisted. And I watched fucking Piranha 3D with my parents as an adult within an auditorium full of teenage boys. And there's a moment where a severed penis is, you know, floating in front of you. And I thought, this is why I love 3D. (laughs) I, I, I hope they are squirming in their seats, you know, not to mention just all the tits and killer fish, you know, but that point, that point where they got to a severed penis, it's like, that's why you make a movie 3D, you know? Uh, Yeah. I think there was a, an interesting era there and I would lump drive angry and uh, my bloody Valentine 3D Mm. into this sort of thing where there were filmmakers who were like, all right, uh, if we're going to do this, like let's utilize what we have to maximize the effect of 3d, as opposed to a lot of 3d conversions that we kind of got along the way where it's like, we're going to add some space into Jurassic park. You're like, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the nice thing there is, uh, you know, Drive Angry and My Bloody Valentine 3D were made by the same filmmakers. So, like, they actually knew what they were doing. I love having a severed eyeball fly at me. That's way better (laughs) than than a can of tab. I'm sorry. Like, (laughs) Well, I mean, let's face it. The most interesting 3D moment in this movie probably is the fly. The flies, I guess. You know, I'm trying to think of what would be more exciting. The, I will say, the hot tub demon at the end of this breathing fire is uh-huh. perhaps the best 3D effect they have in the entire thing. I, I um, can also see like the diet final destination to like through oh, the window. The that, pole. That, yeah. Which is yeah. Driving. yeah. Yeah. That pole works. It does work. And when that skeleton wants a hug, that works. Like to see that in 3D, you're like, all right, this was worth the price of admission. And, and but, where, the, where, the, where the guy that discovers her just looks sort of puzzled. <laughs> <laughs> the community theater Jesus who pulls up right next to him like, hey, what's up with this smoking car? <laughs> he walked right off the set of Godspell and into history. <laughs> <laughs> and then he opens the door and there's a skeleton that says, I, I'm cold, give me hugs. And he's like, uh, nope. Walks away and then the whole car decides to catch fire. This is one of the elements of this movie that is super weird to me. Whereas before the elements of the Amityville horror happened inside a house. 
Now it can just go where it wants. So <laughs> yeah, I don't I, understand that, what the house wants anymore. Yeah, it's that very was some, confused. That was something that annoyed me is that you know haunting is is place based. It, you know, yeah. you're not, but here we've got like, you know, you know killer elevators and, and, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, pipes flying out of the backs of cars and, and, yeah. you know, briefcases lighting on fire by themselves. And, and you know, almost none of this happens in the house. No, uh, really, it takes until the end for anything to happen in the house. Uh, even the supposed great tragedy happens outside of the house. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, let's continually uh, continue to introduce our characters. Uh, we have Nancy, played by Tess Harper, or a dozen small bone birds wearing her flesh. Who can tell? <laughs> um, she's uh, John's soon-to-be ex, and she's also wearing a flannel muumuu in her introductory scene that also has a Star Trek The Next Generation collar on it. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting costuming well, choice. Let's put look, it her way. costume was stolen. It was stolen. <laughs> <laughs> and everything they replaced it with is fucking insane. If there's one character who is walking around in the most nutso outfits, it is Nancy. I mean, everything <laughs> is, every shoulder is capped. Every collar is popped. And her haircut looks like a, a mo haircut with a mullet attached to it. It is wild. <laughs> well, I guess we now know what was popular in Mexico City uh, when this <laughs> film was made. Because it yes. seems like, you know, probably if, if everything was stolen and they're, you know, getting ready to shoot, someone had to run out and buy a bunch of stuff from, you know, the available stores in Mexico City. Yeah, this is what was popping at El Macy's, I suppose. <laughs> I um, love it. <laughs> uh, we also are introduced uh, to her daughter, Susan, played by convicted felon, uh, Lori Laughlin. Um, we also meet Susan's best friend, Lisa, who is played by Meg Ryan. And as soon as she uh, appears on screen, as we stated, she's one of the most engaging screen presences in the entire movie, hands down. This is when we are introduced to the concept that Melanie's photographs, Candy Clark's, uh, her, she's either a terrible photographer or the movie has just decided to rip off the omen because every picture of Sanders uh, looks uh, completely warped and weird. Yeah, it looks like just they put like deli meat on his face, to be <laughs> honest. Like, just, I... Yeah, according to the Wik Wikipedia plot description, it's supposed to be, you know, he's supposed to be like a rotting corpse in it. And I'm like, eh, I guess. Mm -hmm. All, All right. right. I don't know. It looks like an unsuccessful indie band cover is what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, Sanders returns to the house to sign some paperwork or I don't know why, but he wanders in a completely open door yet again. And every time he turns a corner, he looks like he's having a mild heart attack. And then he turns another corner and he's having a major heart attack. Uh, he enters uh, what I believe if I'm remembering correctly is Jody's room. Uh, up on the third floor, and uh, this is where he is attacked by many, many flies or chocolate-covered raisins. You choose. <laughs> that whole, I love that this scene feels like it takes about 25 minutes. <laughs> you just kind of like every, I know they're trying to make it look like he's covered in flies, but really it looks like a guy who's been told, don't move or those flies will fall off your face. It, yeah, but then Tony Roberts shows up and he's dead, and I'm just kind of like, did they sell the house though? Like, did like I th <laughs> like if if he's not there to sign the paperwork? Yeah, yeah I, I feel like if you're and I mentioned this on Twitter, I feel like that if your real estate agent just drops dead in your house, that's you know that should let you back out your mortgage. <laughs> Tony Roberts feels it seems like he has something to prove here, which I I don't know what it is. <laughs> But how did he die exactly? Like, did the flies nibble on him? Or, like, I kept thinking, like, even a swarm of flies, while it would be very disgusting and a horrible yeah. experience, would they kill you? I, I don't... I, I, still... I, I, I assume he had a, a heart attack or... You know, oh, from, okay. But, but, but also he had, again, many opportunities to turn around and walk out of that room. Right. Yes. And he's like frozen in place. Like, he's like I, I, I'm not allowed to move out of frame. This is my spot. I have to have to be here right on my spot. Right. As, or like move your arms or hands to swat them away. Yeah. Even Rod Steiger, like put some effort into it in that first movie. And here he's like, don't move. 
Don't move. Yeah, Patrick. will see you if you move. Patrick, this is a classic. Well, I've had a good, I've had a good run, Death. <laughs> right. Where they, just, you know, they, they, they just see what they see what's coming, and then they're just they're just accepting it. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Uh, this is the way it happens. All right. Should have seen that one coming. Not, not what I not what I expected, but you know what? That's fine. Yeah. I don't know. I guess like if you work for like 20th century real estate or whatever, I don't know. And you're selling the Amityville house. You probably know your like tickets going to get punched at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was probably just one of those things. She's like, it was, at least it was the flies, not like the fucking frost, whatever, you know? Like, yeah. Like, I didn't fall through the the stairs into a hell pit or, or the, or the jacuzzi demon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, along the way, we learned that uh, Susan is going to choose Jody's old room for for where she wants to stay when she's in the house, something her mom is very against. Um, and all this time, it seems like every scene starts watching cars pull up in a fucking driveway. And it's like, it's like put it on the poster. Amityville 3D, you will believe a driveway is where you park your cars. Like, this is not scary, everyone. I mean, maybe... It has convenient parking. The Amityville driveway is the, the movie we all make together. That's... <laughs> <laughs> And this is uh, where Melanie uh, comes over to the house. They're going to lay out this article. And Candy Clark is in the middle of a sense memory workshop, and she's committed to it. We have that great scene with her and Dolores, a, a, a character we never see again. She just, like, shows up to be made once as, like, yeah, this isn't worth this. I'm getting a better job, and wanders away from this movie immediately. Oh, yeah, I guess we don't see her again. And was she the maid for the house, or was she Tony Roberts' maid? Tony seems to be very familiar with her. He's like, Dolores will be there. So, like, it, she used to clean his apartment and is now schlepping it out to Long Island. Oh, yeah, to- I mean, that's the real horror. You're going to make someone take... <laughs> The, the highway from Manhattan into Long Island to clean your haunted house? No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I listen, Dolores does great work. I, I want to keep her employed too, but Jesus fucking Christ. That <laughs> seems like one hell of a trip. Uh, in the middle of this, though, John is meeting a, a book agent because <laughs> someone wants to read more of what he's cooking up, uh, which is probably the most far-fetched idea in this entire movie. And he's almost killed by a haunted elevator. In a sequence that says, mm, Damien the Omen 2 did it better. Yeah, but you know, in the news these days, we always see when A24 puts out a new movie or whatever, everyone's excited about elevated horror, but we finally have <laughs> elevator horror. And Absolutely true. this yeah. is it. This is the moment. <laughs> Elevators were having a moment. Um, he's later just rubs his neck and learns that it was inspected just last Friday. I mean, nothing says horror movie like learning where an elevator was inspected. Um, Melanie uh, is still back at Amityville Central and she's gaining sexual gratification from a slight breeze when she opens a door. Uh, and then we learn that the entire house is drafty uh, sparks start flying uh, from the thermometer and uh, they didn't refrigerate the set. What they did was put a tiny box in her mouth filled with dry ice and she would just breathe on it and that would come out cold breath. Wait, is that true? Yes, that Wait, is absolutely true. So Candy Clark almost died for this movie? No. <laughs> <laughs> that- you you don't trust Mexico City's greatest dry ice guys to stick a box in your mouth and have it come out vapor? I wow. I I do uh, yeah, you know, I don't even have words for whatever that is. Uh, I of course uh, of course I'm I'm sitting over here going like I'm going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Michael's being really reasonable like you could die from that and I'm like, "Oh my god, I need some dry ice." <laughs> Look. Breathe through your nose and out through your mouth. You'll be fine. Well, they make these things in uh, San Francisco uh, at, at Japantown called like dragon pops or something. And all the kids mm. um, do them and they just stick this sort of like dry ice. It looks like a lollipop or something in their mouth and they and they breathe through their nose. Like, I, I think it's a thing that you can do safely, Michael. Calm down. Well, you know what, Peaches? Go ahead and put it in, in the terror vault haunt. And uh, yeah, there we go. I will. And then we'll see. 
<laughs> we'll just see. Yeah. Um, Michael, do you have liability insurance on the new podcast? Because you might want to take that out. <laughs> <laughs> I will be well, making some calls. <laughs> speaking of liability insurance, that was the other thing that I, I don't know if it's because it's the early 80s or what, but I was thinking after that elevator scene, like, really? You're just going to walk away? You're not you know, <laughs> You're not going to call a lawyer or the police? Like, hello? Oh, no, we've all been in an elevator that <laughs> shot up to the top floor and right. then zoomed back down where you're you're hung onto the ceiling so, like so you're a scarecrow. Hard, so yeah. hard, being knocked about like like one of those paddle ball games. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just kind of like, oh, was inspected recently? Okay, uh, all right, have a nice day. Right, but I mean, like this movie needed another side quest, right? Like, I mean, can, can you imagine if we diverted into Amityville, no. the, the civil suit? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> oh my God. Am- Amityville, the chiropractor visit. Right. <laughs> Uh, Am- Amityville, you know, taking a deposition. Like, we could right? have all of this. How about Amityville, Judge Judy edition? Oh, my God. <laughs> Would watch. Yeah. That actually, me too. <laughs> we need to get her involved in some way. I mean, she's yeah. coming off the Judge show. She's free. Right. I think we make an offer and see what happens. Uh, meanwhile, Candy Clark gets a visit from Jack Frost. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of snow and ice uh, slapped onto her face. And then when Tony Roberts finally arrives, she's like, don't touch me. Don't touch me. And I get it. I don't want Tony Roberts touching me either. I get it. Same. <laughs> but no, I, mean, I agree with Peaches. This is one of the great like moments of the movie. Her unhinged performance <laughs> is so good. <laughs> oh, it's fabulous. I mean, at least someone in the movie was committed to the moment and trying to bring that moment to life. Like when she leaves the film, it, the movie doesn't get better. Let's put it that way. I mean, I always like when I see a movie like this, uh, I, I stop to think to myself, did Candy Clark ever see this film? Those are, the, those are the <laughs> things that I like to, to question. <laughs> uh, if to hear her in the special features of the scream factory special edition, uh, she thought she was overdoing it on this on the set, but when she watched it in the relation to the movie, she thought, "No, it works here." So she went easy on herself, is what it comes down to. <laughs> she thought it worked. I hate to harp on everyone's hair here, but um, Tony Roberts looks like he's built a geodesic dome of hair around his head in this motion picture. <laughs> There were a lot of hair choices in this movie. I mean, it was very of the time, but also not because, yeah. I, you know, the Aquanet budget was real. <laughs> very true. Uh, yeah, there are just some, like, for every Candy Clark bang, there's someone who's just being done wrong here. There's there's a lot of hair applications, but not a lot of hair volume. It's super weird. Well, I mean, if we're going to get into that territory, and I don't know, Peaches, if you clocked this, but I did. When we get Meg Ryan with her, like, white eyeshadow, I'm like, oh, she's got bad girl eyeshadow on. Yeah. <laughs> of course I clocked it. And speaking of hair, Lori Laughlin's hair was, like, right out of a Breck commercial. It was flawless. <laughs> she had the best hair in the whole movie. My God. I was I was staring at her hair thinking, oh, my God, she looks like she could have done one of those commercials. She's like a yeah. Jordache model. No, I mean, she, <laughs> she really does look like a Jordache model. <laughs> or she had just come off the set of an ABC after school special. Like, she, yeah. when it comes to hair, great. When it comes to brains, mm, <laughs> who I think, needs them when you've got hair like that? That's exactly <laughs> that's what she was always told, and then she ended up in jail. Anyways, yeah. um, cut to Doctor Professor West uh, and Nancy, who apparently know each other for some fucking reason. And um, DP West, as I'll now be referring to him, is uh, in the middle of torturing someone in an isolation tank that also includes four other people. Yeah, it was so bizarre. Well, also, you're right. The whole Nancy showing up, I think I actually messaged you about this. Like, she just shows up and is like, I don't like that my daughter's in this haunted house and you need to do something. And I'm like, can you two know each other how exactly? (laughs) Like, because that was not established at all. And it's just like ex-wife is suddenly hanging out at Psychic Institute of Long Island. You know, the (laughs) the accredited Psychic Institute of Long Island. I don't know. I just, again, I think that was just sort of like a, a Band-Aid on a bleeding plot hole that they needed to, to get from point A to point B. Yeah, and this, like, these experiments that he's doing, it, it just goes nowhere. 
It's just you've yeah. got the, you got this one scene of this girl just like freaking out, and then you know we don't know what he's doing to her and what it has to do with anything. It's just never explained. But you know me, Gina. When I see a doctor's office, I immediately start to look for a cat on a San Francisco trolley train poster in the back. That's a once in a lifetime thing. You know this. Stop I looking. Know. Stop looking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say but, I say this with love. You're only going to be met with disappointment. Wait, is this well, a thing? Like, yeah. Watch the original Nightmare on Elm Street, and when um, when she goes to the sleep clinic, and her mom's watching her from behind the glass. If you look in the background, there is a poster up on the wall of a cat dressed like Magnum PI hanging off the side of a cat-sized uh, trolley car. And the little trolley car cat inside is driving the trolley car, and he has a little <laughs> mustache and hat. Oh, oh wow. That is I, a real fucking thing that really fucking happened. There's also yeah. a werewolf with a nice ass. <laughs> in a Nightmare on Elm Street? Yes, just a, a, a picture, a, a picture of one, not 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 yeah. like a, an actual real life werewolf. <laughs> oh, a, a werewolf with a nice ass doesn't like make a guest appearance. It's a picture on the wall, but oh, I funny. think the werewolf with a nice ass, you know, only adds to a motion picture. I'm just built that way. I agree. Absolutely. No, I was just going to say I've, I've seen a Nightmare on Elm Street so many times. It's like my, one of my favorite movies. But I'm realizing now the clarity with which these things are now put out versus the 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 crappy VHS that I watched a movie a hundred times on. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you, you rewatch them now and you're like, oh, that's what that was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you've got like Blu-ray where you can see like right. the, every pore on the actors faces. Yeah. Which I don't always think is like a good thing. I, no. you know, I, I think that we all came, uh, I'm assuming we all came from the generation of like, you see a lot, you saw a lot of these on VHS and like mm-hmm. some movies I think are better served, not just on a VHS, but like a third generation VHS. Like Evil Dead is one of my favorite movies and it is not a movie that I need to see in 4K. I don't want to exactly. like, I don't want to yeah. see the strings in the cabin. Like I kind of want to question what it is I'm watching. I, I'd rather see it in 4-3. Like, I don't need all the bells and whistles on that one. In yeah, they yeah. they did a big screening here in San Francisco a few years ago at the Paramount in Oakland of a, of a restored and, uh, you know, enhanced Wizard of Oz. And I went and I was so disappointed when it was over. I could see, you know, the prosthetic on base. I could see the matte <laughs> paintings where the lines and the seams were. And I thought, fuck this. I never want to see the movie like that again. Like, <laughs> Give me the, you know, the crappy old version any day of the week. Uh, The only thing that I found of interest in DP West's office is he has a picture of an exit door. And I don't know what that means, but he has it. It's no werewolf with a nice ass. Um, (laughs) Well, it's because it's artifice. It's not real. There's no exit just as we felt watching this movie. (laughs) Ferrati, you're starting to make sense. This movie's supposed to not make sense. Um, that, that makes this have intentionality. That's the last thing that we want. Um, but, uh, Meg Ryan drags Lori Laughlin back to the house and she's like, let me take you for a tour of your murder house. And then makes a statement that I, I wanted to ask all three of you. Have you ever had sex with a ghost? Oh, um, well, apparently my apartment's haunted, which I just found out today via oh. a video chat. So, uh, <laughs> You know, let's hold out. Like, who, who right. knows? I'll report back. Gina, what say you? I mean, I, I used to drink a lot when I was young, so it's possible. <laughs> and ghosts like to take advantage is what you're saying? Well, they, yeah, they're, they find they're, you an easy mark? They're, 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 they're sneaky fellows. Okay. Well, Peaches, uh, you're my ringer here. Uh, sex with a ghost, yes or no? I would love to say yes, but I have to be honest and and uh, admit that it's on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> it might end up being your bucket. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. And just so everyone knows, when it comes to Ghostbusters rules, no, sex with a ghost is not just a blowjob, Mr. Dan Aykroyd. Uh, anyways, uh, but that's another PG film. So once again, <laughs> incredibly, <laughs> incredibly, <laughs> unbelievably. Um, and we later learn from Lori Laughlin that uh, that her dad does not appreciate uh, breasts. He's more of a ghost ass man, I guess. I don't know. She never really completes her thought. Yeah, that but, exchange um, was really weird. She knows way more about her dad's like sexual proclivities than like I think is comfortable. 
Yeah, very much so. Uh, but that you know, she's a child of divorce. Uh, she's a little bit older. Who's to say? I, I, I would put out a possibility that you know John Roberts is very loud about what he likes or enjoys. You know, when the cameras aren't rolling. Sure. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, uh, later we're back at Nancy's house and we get a view of her pantry, um, as she's telling Susan, never go back to the Amityville house. And I just have to say her pantry is fucking psychotic. We see it twice. She has one shelf. That's just six identical yellow coffee mugs on display. (laughs) Who fucking does who, who fucking does this? Well, I mean, she might have gotten a good deal at like you know, Bradley's I mean, or something. It's like that's you know the the fascination of art department stuff. It's like when in uh, Friday too when they open Alice's fridge and she's got what like three cartons of milk or something. It's like okay, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was yeah. what was around that day. They probably again they're in Mexico. They probably went down to wherever and they're like, you got four yellow mugs done. Let's done. Go. You want you want to see macaroni in a clear jar? You got it. Um, <laughs> this is also a high point in, T- in Tess Harper's uh, costume journey. She's dressed like an institutional candy striper. The apron on this dress is not like a tie-on apron. It's a part of the dress. <laughs> Meanwhile, if you wanted to watch Tony Roberts pensively type, you're in luck. This movie has what feels like half an hour of it as he types and drinks out of a, a rocks glass of some bourbon or other. Uh, John has a framed inspirational poster about the desert. Mm, what a catch. Hmm. John walks upstairs to find that his bathroom has been taken over by Dracul. It's all foggy and steamy. Turns out that the hot water faucet is just spraying out water. And while he's trying to turn it off, the walls close in on him. Now, this is the one thing I think that the 3D makes this scene 5% cooler than it would be to 2D people. I actually didn't hate this scene. Like, I have to say that, like, you know, of of the set pieces that we got in the movie, I was Mm. like, okay, this is visually interesting, I suppose. Like, you know, if you were going to be, like, terrorized by moving wallpaper, this is the moment for it to happen. (laughs) Did you find it a little confusing, like, was it a shower curtain that was behind him and then a wall that looked like the shower curtain to the side of him that was pushing in? Yes, I felt that too. Yeah. And, then, and then I was like, did they match the shower curtain to the wallpaper? Right. Or, or was the wallpaper literally just like a thin fabric and that wasn't actually supposed to be a shower curtain? It was just shitty like set design? I don't know. Like It was a bad choice. <laughs> it yeah. definitely took me out of the moment. It was a bad choice. The, the shower yeah. curtain is white with this, a similar pattern mm. in brown. And then the the wallpaper is green with a brown pattern. So yes, when it comes to differentiating these two walls, they did a very poor job of doing that. Yeah, yeah. I was I was I was lost, yeah. lost in the pulsing wall. But I agree with you, Michael. I did find it to be an interesting scene. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like he basically had that like whole Turkish bath moment, uh, <laughs> and then the walls move. I don't yeah. know. And, and then they don't. And then he turns off the water. He's like, okay, danger over. And we're like, oh, I think yay. considering a lot of the rest of the movie, we are latching on to things like the moving walls and, and the killer flies because there's nothing else. You it's know? true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's you know, a couple halfway decent moments and then a whole lot of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Melanie being spooked by a hidden piranha or bat boy in that picture of Sanders doesn't exactly leap out as the spookiest thing I've ever witnessed. But like her little scene where she's trapped in the car and she kind of gets final destination. Like, uh, that's yeah, fun. that seems cool, I guess. I mean, like, it, I guess in the, in the way, though, Peaches is right. It, it Is it cool or is it? in comparison to the great walking tour of this house that is 90% of the movie. Um, the latter. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> is that, that's the next, that's fairly certain uh, quickly after this though, like with the, the, the Candy Clark final yes. destination burning. She's alive, rushing yeah. to John to show him these photographs of the hot tub demon in Sanders cheek. And she ends up uh, being 
uh, emulated in her own car, uh, almost get her getting her head uh, caved in by uh, a, a truck hauling pipes. And then she's burned alive. Community theater Jesus shows up, opens the door. Skeleton wants a hug. And we discover that this skeleton has 57 teeth in the top of its head. Oh, yeah, it is. It is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> Didn't get a big look at Candy Clark's mouth, but I'm pretty sure she doesn't have 500 teeth in the top part of her mouth. You know what I mean? It's that they, they gave her some sort of sheep's head fish sort of mouth in that skeleton. And then the car burns up and we're done with it. And then we barely ever talk about it again. Yeah, it's strange. Yeah, Tony Roberts is is up up to a point remarkably unruffled by anything that that happens in this movie. Yeah, he, like, he begins to look stupid. Yeah, is he, what it comes down he, to. He, the real estate agent dies in his house. Oh, that's strange. Mm, okay. you know, he, he gets he gets caught in a you know malfunctioning elevator. Oh, that's strange. Mm. It happens every other Thursday. It's New York City, Gina. You know his, his coworker slash friend that has some sort of nervous breakdown in his house and flees. Huh, that's strange. Okay, mm, you know things happen. She burns alive in a car. You know. <laughs> We live in a society, I guess, <laughs> is his response. That's life, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Nancy refuses to let Susan return to the house. So, of course, cue Susan returning to the house uh, with uh, Meg Ryan in tow and one feather-haired bohunk named David and a dork named Roger. And they decide to host a casual midday seance in Jody's room. And you get a lot of uh, glass pushing. Which apparently involves them painstakingly cutting out letters. <laughs> yeah, their Ouija board sucked. I <laughs> guess they didn't want to pay that money to whoever owns the right to I think it's just board. I think it's just literally Parker Brothers at this point. <laughs> Uh, they got one good movie out of it anyways. Um, yeah, but then we no, get this like Mason jar of the damned scene or whatever the fuck is going on. <laughs> <laughs> Where they just accuse each other of pushing it and then making sure that we forecast that one of them is going to die and it's definitely going to be Susan. And when that happens, what better place to do it than on the open water? So they go off on a boat. We don't even know whose boat that is. They just all climb aboard and take off. Meanwhile, Nancy shows up dressed in a raggedy Ann kimono. Uh, I I don't even know how to rank her outfits. They are all fucking crazy. That's a whole different show, man. Like, (laughs) Uh, And into the house walks a uh, soaking wet Susan. Not in a good way. I love the moist ghost of Lori Loughlin. Um, (laughs) I think that this was like such a bizarre choice. I mean, I get it. Like, I think that they were going for like some high drama here, but like when she sees like the wet and like extremely pensive looking ghost of Lori Loughlin, and then, you know, she comes downstairs only to discover the dead body of her daughter at at the water. And there's like, you know, Tony Roberts again being nonplussed. It's it's all kind of like, okay, I see the high drama here. But it was executed yeah. really bizarre. I mean, I guess yeah. the one thing well, is this, this. I will say this: her wet hair was still looking fierce. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't like drowning in the lake. Uh, you know, messed up that hair. I mean, it looked like it had been combed out nicely. Well, I will, and I will also say this: this is one circumstance where Lori Laughlin didn't have to worry about college. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Uh, out in the nick of time. She didn't have to worry about that test, those test scores at all. <laughs> um, one of the guys who brings her back, I just <laughs> says, she fell out. I don't know. Why don't you know? There's four of you in this fucking boat. You also, don't know how someone also, fell again, out of it? None of them are upset. No one's crying. You know, no, no. no one is overreacting. You know, your friend just, you know, presumably fell out of a boat and drowned in front of your very eyes. And you're just kind of like, Oh, she fell out. I don't know. <laughs> oh, maybe try to wake her up is like John's reaction to his dead daughter. She's like, come on, wake up. That's not CPR. Why doesn't anyone attempt CPR until the paramedics are there? I mean, to be fair, he works for reveal magazine. He's not the most <laughs> like informed person. <laughs> he looks like a guy who jogs. Like they used to teach you that like, 
you know, if you find somebody who's passed out, give him CPR. Like it was, that was a big push in the seven days. Like he should be aware of this. You should at least give him the moment to heroically attempt to revive his daughter and more like, mm, let's wait for these two guys in, in, in bad hats to arrive right. to kind of give her CPR. It's just really not so quiet desperation. The movie. <laughs> and and th- there's a bit of this sort of sense of, oh, this, okay, we all agree that the the sort of, the, the fact that the haunted house now, I, I don't know, the ha- the haunted spirits, you know, can be in elevators and on the highway or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's sort of like, well, there could have been an opportunity for at least uh, a sort of a fun final destination kind of um, sequence of events. But this is such a missed opportunity. It's like, what we we don't even get to see her drowned or like understand like why not run her over with the boat i don't know like exactly why not put that that boat propeller in three exactly like it's it's almost as like they ran out of money right i don't know she goes on a boat and drowns and yeah i guess it's it's true and also like you know since we're on a show called kill by kill it's like this is one of the cardinal sins of horror cinema you kill a main character off screen like Uh. That's so like, and she's a name star. They rank her above Meg Ryan in this movie. It's like, all right, whatever. I guess at that point, they're just like, all right, we're in the third act now. Let's go. There's a lot of, I don't know, shoulders happening uh, at this point in the motion picture. They really don't know what to do. Uh, We get a, John has a dream sequence in which he wanders down to uh, the basement and we see the hellbound hot tub and just out of a (laughs) roiling boil comes Hell Susan mannequin. Uh, but ooh, it was all a dream. And, and you know, you'd see Tony Roberts in yet another turtleneck. And you're like, oh my God. And so then, spooky. And then Nancy just decides she's not going to leave. No, she's going to, even if the ghost is wrecking the kitchen, she's going to keep ironing that blouse. God damn it. I mean, that's that's a through line of all the Amityville movies, though. In, <laughs> in, in, the, in the much better... Uh, Evil with Evil Within, uh, or whatever it's called, with uh, Patty Duke. There's that whole mm-hmm. sequence where Patty Duke's mom sticks her hand in like the garbage disposal, and at that point, everyone should be like, "Let's leave the fucking house." And they're just like, <laughs> "Grandma's crazy," and that's it. Like, you know, like, so I think every time there's a point where you should leave, and they don't. Yeah. The most well, interesting yeah. part of that whole ironing sequence, you know, for me was the reminder that something called Five Alive once existed, yes. which, was a, <laughs> which was a drink, and it was just sitting prominently right behind her. And I was like, Five Alive? Oh, yeah, that was a disgusting, <laughs> like, citrus drink. I don't even know how to, I, like, if some millennial asked me what it was, I, I don't know that I'd be able to describe it. But there it was. A, it was a shelf-stable orange juice that yeah. you didn't have to refrigerate which sounds terrible and it was yes it was there's Amit- a reason you don't have it anymore amityville haunted by the ghosts of refreshment past <laughs> <laughs> oh my god what's coming out of that hell hot tub is it the purple stuff oh no she's got a um, sema run <laughs> well f- five alive could survive the temperatures of that basement that's true very true, very true. Um, and so John is at the end of his rope, uh, his daughter dead, his ex-wife catatonic. And he asked DP West, can you come over to the house? Uh, and he goes like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to bring over 30 nameless, faceless people to zap your house with predator vision and the guns from looker. And we're going to figure out this ghost shit once and for all. And but presu- you get and to presu- see a boom mic in 3D. And presumably they all get blown up in the house. We don't care. They don't have names. <laughs> Not a single one of them. And uh, they all, I don't, I wish I could describe all the background characters here, but they all look like they were split off from a single celled Broadway auditioner. You know, <laughs> they all have the same look. Like you've seen their, their eight by 10 a million times. Like half of them look exactly the same. And then there's one girl. That's it. What year is this? They probably like, you know, they're the chorus boys from the rink starring Liza Minnelli and Cheetah Rivera. It was, it was like a loose weekend. 
Yeah, I, I I think that's a very accurate description because half of them look like they're they're cruising the other half who are disinterested. Well, that's the movie I want. Like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> give me the Amityville cruise. Like, you think that you think you th- you're there for ghosts, but like you're in the basement, and that's when you see the real horror fisting. So <laughs> a purple handkerchief in your back pocket means you're going to be haunted by Susan. <laughs> Love that. Oh, God. <laughs> Amityville, Folsom Street edition. Yes. Uh, listen, this is it's a much better pitch than the driveway thing. I think we're <laughs> only getting better and better here. Yeah, yeah. Someone, someone gets a haunted hanky from the yard sale. <laughs> and- oh, my God. We really, this is all coming together. Haunted hanky. Just yeah. that. That's the title. And, and then they bring it to the bay and shit goes crazy at Folsom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Done. Done. <laughs> Oh, my God. And in the uh, immortal words of Dr. Professor West, let it happen. Susan gets visited by uh, what is, I assume, Susan's ghost or the manifestation of Prince's sexual charisma. (laughs) And it leads her down, not quickly, to the basement. And uh, John is told, don't interfere, my God. Don't interfere with this full, free-floating purple vapor. Because uh, DP West has a plan, and that is to save Susan's purple soul by doing nothing. He kind of does nothing. Yeah, I think I think the kind of end finale explanation situation is is lacking. <laughs> Just a little bit. Like exactly how they're going to do this? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like trust me, and then he just like sits in front of the well and. He needs to get in that hole, but instead of like easing his way in, you know, by making sure the hole's relaxed, he kind of forces it and (laughs) he ends up with a hot tub demon and that hot tub demon burns half of his face off, giving us one of the best slash worst screams in all of cinema history. I love his comically high-pitched scream. (laughs) <laughs> and I think then if we've learned any moral from Amityville 3D, it's that if you don't ease into the hole and force your way in, it's going to end yeah. in pain. Yeah. No, that is not going to be comfortable for anyone. And you're going to get <laughs> half your face burned off. And then you're just going to be, you know, you're in there now, but you're just shouting, you're free, Susan, you're free. <laughs> uh, the hot tub demon, I just want to say, does resemble the demon that emerges out of Ronald DeFeo in Amityville to the possession. Um, oh. I believe I described it at the time in that episode as a slea stack from land of the lost that was dropped down the stairs a few times. <laughs> it it, it might've been. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they reused it, which is perfectly fine. <laughs> they added a flamethrower to it. They plussed it just a little bit, but this is where the movie decides to go ape shit crazy. So now we're kind of, Gina, we're like three movies into a mini trilogy here, right? Yes. We had Evil Speak, which there's like no movie until the last 10 minutes. And then it's like, movie! And then we have Death Spa, which there's plenty of quote unquote movie, but it still ends in movie where everything goes crazy. And um, crashes I down. just want to say I've been to the Death Spa because it's now a Chase Bank <laughs> on Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> and uh, every time I go in there to do banking, I'm like, I'm in the Death Spa. <laughs> it's it's not real exciting other than that. <laughs> Patrick, if I ever come out to visit you, will you take me to the Death Spa Bank? Absolutely. That's the first thing that we'll do. And okay. it's the only touristy thing that we will air, do. Air, we'll go air, to Death Spa. Airport Death Spa. <laughs> then right back on the plane. Bye-bye. <laughs> So at this point in the movie, the entire set is crashing down around them. It's beams crash, mirror smash, radiator spontaneously orgasm. Uh, Sound person gets blasted by one door through another door. Um, A less sexy ice storm than the ice storm. Uh, Bookcase crashing, decorative shade projectiles, couch moving, TV monitor explosions, Death by wagon wheel? Sure. <laughs> Ice blown defenestration? A uh, chandelier coming at you? At one point, John pulls up the collar of his button down shirt to get warm. <laughs> I, don't I don't know how that fucking happens. But that happens right before the crowning glory of this motion picture the swordfish attack. 
Yeah. I love the swordfish attack. I find it uh, insane, stupid, poorly planned, poorly executed, and without a doubt probably brought any house that was watching this down in laughter. <laughs> it's just uh, it's a slow motion push of <laughs> with swordfish, and you're kind of like, was I supposed to be scared by that? No, no one was scared by any of this. Finally, John uh, breaks down this bay window door and they get outside and then we have a total home model explosion. Again, the house explodes again. It, it blows up like six separate times. <laughs> it's not enough the first time and it's not enough the next seven, but finally it kind of all crumbles to the ground. And you have to wonder if if John's home insurance place is really going to pay out on something like this. But it doesn't all crumble. That's the thing. It's like it blows up a million times. And then there's like <laughs> stuff like <laughs> like a door intact and like a doll. And, you know, it's like, wait, uh, didn't we just watch this? The biggest explosion of, of the universe? Just, you know, I guess I don't know. Maybe that's all part of the the haunt you know sure. stuff with protected the ghosts preserve certain right objects. they're like don't touch that doll <laughs> now is the doll that keeps showing up in this supposed to be annabelle is it mm. i don't know because the real annabelle is like a raggedy ann doll you know i have to tell you i think you're onto something because if you look up what the real annabelle looks like that is kind of what it looks like so yeah. you're probably right uh it's just a weird ad and lorraine warren thread that's kind of going through this that I had never noticed before because I hadn't watched any of, of those new movies in between watchings of, of, of viewings of Amityville 3D. Um, and Peaches, it's the only time I've ever gotten close to anything. So I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and John and Nancy, you know, walk away like, wow, we've had better days. And then a green screen fly appears. And glowing, <laughs> yeah, like, glowing purple, which I which I love. <laughs> Does that mean that Susan's spirit is inside that one fly? Or is that just bad green screen? I guess it does. Oh, Why man. not both? <laughs> <laughs> it works. Sure. Why not? And so does anyone else have anything that they absolutely need to say? about Amityville 3D before we close this haunted book. I think this movie speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> and very long expository dialogue. Well, you know how, like, when we did Death Spa, we were like, oh, this episode's going to be 45 minutes or it's going to be three hours. Yeah. And, and we still felt like we didn't, that we, we end up skipping over a lot. I, I think you covered every possible salient point of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's because, so, like, Death Spa is one of those movies that, like, it, for all justifiable reasons, should probably be a cult classic because it's batshit insane. Like, and it, it is yeah. it's a movie that I'm, like, very familiar with. And it's, it, if Death Spa is guilty of anything, it's just that it's packed to the brim with too much. Is it, which is maybe, possibly, it's a ghost. There's a slasher. Also, there's a supercomputer. Is this guy gay? Yes. And then you're just like, <laughs> what's happening? And then... So, like, by the time you're done, you're like, I can talk about everything about this movie or nothing about this movie. And the problem with Amityville 3D <laughs> is there's... The only problem. Uh, yeah. Let's put that out yeah. there. There's one problem, and it is this. Go. Is that it is the exact opposite. It is not packed to the brim at all. There's a no. lot of just sort of like, <sighs> this house has problems. And you're like, yeah. yeah, bitch, it's the third movie. We know. You got to you gotta move a little more up. <laughs> yeah, it's just so much. Like, I would say a good 65% of this movie is just people walking around the house looking slightly uneasy. And then occasionally fire turns into an ice column, and that's what they call excitement. Yeah, I was actually excited when it started for some, like, I thought, oh, this might be, I might actually get scared. You know, I, I like, I like still, you know, allowing a movie to kind of take me on a, 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 a trip and this, it would also, I told Michael this earlier, uh, the whole time I was watching it, I was like, have I seen this before? I'm pretty sure I've seen this before. What? I guess I didn't remember Meg Ryan. And then when it got to the end and it actually turned into a movie, I was like, oh, my God, I've seen this before. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what this is. And I, you know, I, I knew what was going to happen next because then it was like, oh, yeah. But 
I had somehow completely blocked the first two acts from my my mind, you know. Well, because nothing happens. Right, yeah. exactly. But so. what's, what is interesting about that and, like, the little behind the scenes of the studio is that Amityville 2, for uh, the people who don't know, is super sleazy. Yes. Like, it, yeah. it's, it's got, like, such transgressive sexual themes. There's, like, rape themes, incest themes. Like, you know, brother and sister go to naughty town. Uh, at least, or at least I'm like equating some VC Andrews like situation there. And when that movie came out, people were like, what? How, how is this a sequel to a James Brolin movie? Right. And, right. and so then they kind of got the studio mandate, like you can't do that again. And so yeah. then we got this much safer question mark PG movie. And uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just interesting to me. It's just interesting to me, it's interesting to me that the original zero deaths in it, other, yeah. other than the 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 uh, the prologue, which you know establishes the, the murders took place in the house before everything happens, and it's still a much scarier, much more atmospheric movie than this, which has four or five, possibly up to thirty deaths in it if you're counting the <laughs> if you're counting. Uh, um, yeah, I lost count at the end. The uh, the Psychic Institute's crew. Yeah, it, this movie is is filled with death, grisly death, and yet it is in no way, shape, or form anywhere close to as scary or memorable or impactful. Like I think, I'm like I don't know that. While the Amityville horror was a sensation at the time, and let's put it in its place, it was the second biggest box office hit of 1979. That's how huge that movie was. It was made for like $4 million and change, and it ended up making nearly 90 It was the most successful independent film uh, after Halloween, and it took until Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to knock it off its, 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 uh, its uh, throne. So, like, it is a huge movie, and then you have this, like, sleazy, gross meatball with hair on the ground all over it uh, sequel. <laughs> <laughs> that that ends with a completely different exorcist movie uh, because that only happens because the priest decides I'm not going to go camping with my boyfriend this weekend. <laughs> That's in that movie. And, and then you have this, which is ignores all of that and just is its own unique, weird fucking movie. And it's made for $6 million and it makes $6 million. And people go, this is dead. It was that quick of a decline in people being interested in this. When things die, they die sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Unless they live again in a clock. The third, yeah, the, it, I, I was thinking about that, how the third uh, film in a franchise is so interesting <laughs> often, right? Like we get this weird Amityville 3D, we got Jaws 3D, uh, mm. we got Season of the Witch, you know, we, and, and, and I would say Season of the Witch, I actually think is an interesting film on its, in its own right. Maybe it just yes. shouldn't have been Halloween 3, it's, right? It's not a, it's not a good, it's not a Halloween in the sense that everyone demanded that Michael Myers Halloween movie. Yeah. Right. And so it's a kind of a make it or break it kind of moment for a lot of these franchises. And, you know, you look at something like Dream Warriors and it just completely, you know, set Freddy on a, on a whole new trajectory and capitalized right. on its popularity. And, you know, so yeah, this was really, uh, really a misfire, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, it, you know, Amityville, I mean, same thing with Hellraiser, you know, it's kind of like, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, anything three and after is sort of not, 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 not very well known. I know. I, I kind of love seeing that club owner flex in a mirror while he's fucking a, a gal. I mean, <laughs> it works for me. Man, yeah, well. I'll, I'll tell you, before the pandemic, I went to a matinee at the New Beverly of Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. And <laughs> it was the middle of the week. And it, uh -huh. if you've never seen a motlier assortment of people, <laughs> I bet. Then when you're attending Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth at 2 p.m. on a Wednesday. <laughs> Yeah. Like, and I remember halfway through the movie, like, you know, while Iron Maiden or whatever is, is jamming out, I'm like, I actually blew off work to do this. Like, I, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing yeah, with I, my life? I, and what are all these other people doing with their lives? Yeah, there was, I had like a look around moment. I was like, this is it. This is, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that really, and that's the one where the, there's a Cenobite who has CDs flying out of his head or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just, mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, what a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you know what? There's one final curse that we have to take off of ourselves, and that is choose your own death venture. That is where we decide of the many, many deaths portrayed in this motion picture. If you were forced to die that way, well, which one would you choose and why? Up for bid <laughs> and buckle up because this is quite a list. We have death by prolonged fly exposure, emulated inside of a sedan. Maybe you fell out of a boat, I guess? Half of your face is burned off. Then you're boiled slash frozen in hell in a hot tub. Uh, we have door versus door defenestration. Death by bookcase. Death by wagon wheel. Ice blown defenestration. Just burned up. And some people might have been exploded. We don't know. So of those, I'm going to ask our guests to go first. And because Peaches, this is your... Uh, you know, debut on the show, hopefully one of many, I would like you to go first. Well, for no other reason than I am completely jealous of her glamorous wet afterglow. Uh, <laughs> I would probably choose, I think I may have fallen out of a boat and drowned. I think that that would be it for, for just no other reason than what my ghost is going to look like. Uh, well, that's true. If I envision you in the afterlife, and I hope that comes in many, many years, I would assume it would be a purple glowing mass. Oh, no, I don't mean that. <laughs> oh, you don't. I mean, I mean, when she's walking up the stairs wet and she looks oh. flawless. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Your moist ghost. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. I see. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, Michael? What say you? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you all here. I think that this is one of those final episode questions just because of this movie where you might have set yourself up for failure because who isn't who doesn't want to die off camera? So like, because then, I mean, I'm, I'm with Peaches on this one. I kind of want to die off boat, maybe, question mark? Because mm. one, you know, you leave a really great, albeit wet ghost. And, yeah. and two, like, if I have to choose between that or getting like candle wax blown in my face, or like, you know, being exploded in a sedan. Sure. I mean, you know, if I was going to mix it up, I would say maybe, you know, demon hot tub just because I love a good jacuzzi sitch. But sure. I'm going to have to go with with Lori Laughlin on this one. All right. So. That, that, you might become a purple fly, though. You have that to look forward to. Like there's several stages of her afterlife. I've been That's accused true. of worse. <laughs> All right, Gina, uh, what do you have on deck? Yeah, honestly, I'm going to take uh, Fly to death because he really gets to do some emoting when he's like reaching <laughs> out towards towards Tony Roberts. He's like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and I just love that so much. I like, I just hope I just make those sort of ridiculous noises when I go. You know what, yeah, Gina? I it? applaud that choice. That, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I don't um, know that I, that if I suddenly was just covered in a mass of flies, I wouldn't just stand there and weakly wave my hands around before just sort of sliding down the wall to my death, my doom. <laughs> uh, no, I think that all uh, sounds good. I think, um, you know, just to change it up, I think if I'm going with any of those end of movie deaths, I'm going with door versus door defenestration because it's quick. And there's two doors involved. I mean, that's special. That that's unique. All right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like, if, if, how did how did he die again? One door exploded off its hinges and pushed him through another door. Like, it, you know, right. you, pro you you were probably immolated when that house blew up. So you know, your your family doesn't have to pay for burial expenses. That's right. That's, I'm already ashes. That's true. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. <laughs> Yeah. And it, it, because it, I died via many doors, you know, I'm going places. Yeah, an open <laughs> casket funeral in this economy? <laughs> <laughs> the facts. Oh, my goodness. So before we go, though, um, why don't uh, Michael and Peaches, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your new podcast project that you guys have that, that you both have going on? Peaches, why don't you take us away? Sure. Uh, well, I'm thrilled that Michael and I are debuting our Midnight Mass podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating cult movies, uh, and maybe even more so the cults that made them cult movies. We're really digging mm. into who the people are that have become fanatics and kept these films alive. Uh, and our debut episode, uh, we have a little teaser up that you can go to and listen to, a, a little trailer um, 
and subscribe, hopefully. But our, our debut episode happens a week from today. So we will be launching um, next Wednesday. Uh, and that would be July 28th for those listening in the future. So we may already be out. Oh, that's true. That's true. I You'd think as a podcast professional, such as myself, <laughs> I would understand that maybe this isn't live or happening right this second. And there are people listening. No, this listening. is a live call-in show, Peaches, and we're about to hit the lines. We're going to oh hear God. what people have to say. And th- this is why we're such a great duo, the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're yes, yes, we're live here on Amityville Radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the eyes of Long Island looking out at you. Yeah. yeah. Um, this will come out a, a, a couple weeks after that. So okay. uh, you will you will be out and premiered, and I can't wait to listen. Once I heard about this, I thought, I love both of these people. I love listening to them, and I can't wait. No matter what it is, I can't wait to listen oh, to it. So thank I'm you. very excited. Well, you thank will- you very much. Yeah, no, it, it's been a really great kind of odyssey because one of the things that Peaches and I uh, can share is that we've recorded a good chunk of the season before it debuts. So we uh, have been spending a lot of time with our subjects because it's either the movie, the episode is about a film or a cult figure. And mm. it's not just getting to talk to the people who um, made these things and like created these cults, but then just kind of having the discussions with the people who were inspired by it. For example, we talked, uh, no spoilers, but there's an episode that we do about a certain 70s cult film that Mm. was a flop everywhere in the world except for one city in Canada. And we were very (laughs) fascinated to find out why. And uh, that exploration, I think, is very enriching for Peaches and I because we're both such students of these movies. And in a lot of cases, we know these things very well. But by talking to people who were motivated or moved by these these things in a different way than we were, it, it kind of forces us and uh, allows us to celebrate it anew. And I, I, I'm really yeah. enjoying that. No, oh, I can't wait to listen to it. It sounds fascinating. And both of you are so magnetic uh, and personable. And I, as soon as I saw you were doing something, I'm like, I got to get them both on here <laughs> to talk about something. So I can't wait to listen to it. Uh, Gina, where can people find you on these here internets? Well, when I'm not doing this, I am also on a little side project called White Ladies in Crisis. Uh, by the time this is over, <laughs> or sorry, by the time this airs, we will have covered the Apple TV series Physical. Uh, and then we are going to be starting to go into, we're going to be going on a monthly basis after that and covering uh, feature length films of the same in the same genre. Uh, and I'm also right about movies and TV at the school.net. Excellent. Check it out today. People, of course you can find us on all, all your socials. Uh, our t-shirts are up on T public. The link will be in the description here. We have the Patreon. We have fun stuff happening over there. Uh, in July, we covered, uh, don't panic the Mexican, uh, nightmare on, uh, Elm street ripoff. That is, uh, a motion picture that is for certain <laughs> and worth your time and attention <laughs> it's uh, streaming on shutter right now and then you can join us on over there to uh, help keep this podcast free and of course rate and review us on itunes that helps us be seen and heard by more people and that just about does it uh when we next return we uh, next week we'll be still talking about hannibal on dish by dish and our next episode Uh, of kill by kill will be something special that i think you're gonna want to tune in for uh that just about does it for me and everyone else don't worry the body count will continue for myself for gina for michael for peaches bye-bye everybody bye 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 bye